Hey gang, I'm Will from Tested. And I'm Norm from Tested. Norman Chan. You've seen the future. I have touched the future. You've worn the future. I have put it on my head with a loop around my head and smoked goggles around the front. Yesterday, I spent 90 minutes with HoloLens. Your reality has been augmented. Uh, it has. Uh, so Microsoft is in town this week mm -hmm. for their annual Build Developers Conference, and uh, select journalists were allowed to spend time, along with developers, to try out HoloLens for the first time um, the, the almost, I guess, close to final production units because it's shipping by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to well, talk about... it should about be the Windows 10 launch Windows time 10 frame, launch whatever that means. Frame. They said Windows 10 is going to come out end of the summer or sometime this summer. July-ish. At this time, we don't know, but HoloLens is sooner rather than like long, yeah. long time away. Um, so they had two basic demo sessions. The one that I went to was a 90-minute condensed version of what the programmers went through, where we actually sat down with Unity and built a little application, kind of built a little application mm -hmm. with Unity. It had, um, the, the other session was a 30-minute uh, session that was more focused on real-world apps. Patrick Norton did that one, and we're going to do what we can to get him on the podcast next week to talk about it, because I didn't get to see any of that stuff. Okay. Um, but the security for this was bananas. It was the, it was unlike anything I've seen in a tech demo in 18 or 20 years of doing this. So it wasn't just no cameras. You had to take off all your gear, watch electronics. Uh, anything electronic. Everything in the locker. Right. Is, I mean, is that for no coverage reasons or for performance? Uh, they seemed to think it, they wouldn't say, which makes okay. me think it was probably for security reasons. Okay. They, I thought we were going to get frisked on the way in. Um, but basically, we waited. We got in a line. We were paired up with another person, and uh, then the two people were given a helper, like a guide, uh, who walked you through the process and helped you do things like fit it and okay. and you know if you had problems with the coding tutorials, and they would help you walk through that stuff. In terms of the fitting, they measured your IPD apparently. They measured your IPD. Uh, you put it in software. So mm -hmm. the software, I'm 65, same as I always have been. Mm -hmm. um, but they used the thing you use at the optician. Just you know, you, everybody who wears glasses. Is had that done. Now, in terms of how this projects out to consumer experience, the IPD is kind of important because the distance between your eyes is how convergence, how they can, mm -hmm. they, they know the distance between your eyes and the lens because of where you put the headset on, but then they, to triangulate that convergence mm -hmm. for what they're rendering, they need to know the distance between your so, eyes. So the good thing is there's ways to do that that don't involve using the little dongle. Warby Parker has a really good online webcam-based IPD right. calculator. Right. Um, it, I've used that multiple times. It was super accurate for me, so I assume that, that something like that will be part of the onboarding process for people who buy HoloLens. So um, I've only seen pictures of HoloLens in some <laughs> video before. Uh, the hardware has always been nebulous. I know it looks like a, like a ring you put around your head. Describe the hardware. Yeah, so um, there's basically there's the smoked, glass, smoked plastic lens in the front. Mm -hmm. um, inside that, there's another set of glasses. They're like, you know, about, about like this. And those glasses are actually three panes of glass that are sandwiched together. And that's smaller than like my glasses or your it's glasses. It's smaller than your glasses for sure. Definitely smaller than my glasses. Um, they live inside the smoked glass, the smoked visor. I'm, I'm calling the outside part the goggles, the inside part the glasses. Okay. Um, that whole thing seemed to be sealed. So it seemed like there was no way to put your fingers, say, between the glass bits and the goggles. Um, the glass was only connected to the headband at the top edge of the glass. Mm -hmm. um, and when you looked at the glasses, the glasses inside off axis, it seemed like there were vertical lines through it. So my hunch is that there's some sort of like a Google Glass style laser etching going on and they're blasting light down from the top of the glass and then reflecting it into your eyes. So the, those little lenses on the inside <coughs> is where the, the virtual image lives. It's not on the frosting. And actually, when you look at the glass, the glass is inside, there's a, there's a rectangle on each lens, and that's even where the virtual image wow. lives. So it's not even, it's the, not even the full glass. Okay. It's, so, it's inside the virtual. Uh, we'll talk about the FOB yep, in a minute. Yep. Um, so, OK, attached to the top, um, there's two camera dual camera sensors on either temple. Yep. And then there's another sensor right between your on, your, on the bridge of your nose. Outward facing. All outward facing. Um, those, the two on the outside, I would bet dollars to donuts are depth cameras. Mm -hmm. um, connect two style, not connect one with all the little dots. These mm -hmm. are just two, two stereo cameras that are comparing images and building a 3D map based on that. Yeah. Um, speakers on the ear, those red, those little red tabs that dangle down below the, the edges of the, of the handlebars. Um, now, 
there's two components that wrap around. So you have the two side things that go all the way around where there's like a USB port, some buttons, the speakers hang down. And then on the inside of that, there's a ring that's expandable. It has like a like a utility helmet, construction helmet style twisty knob that okay. stretches it bigger or smaller, or like and a bicycle helmet. That's the crown? Um, and that goes around your crown and you can adjust that so that it rides at really any angle. Like I found the best, most comfortable way was to have it kind of Kind of like this, kind okay. of diagonal, almost like a like a um, you know one of the things the Romans wore, the the you know the woven crown of sure, yes. the, yeah. plants, yeah. whatever. Yep. Yep. Um, it carried the weight really comfortably. It was very comfortable to wear, even for five ten minutes at a time. We didn't get to wear it for longer than that. It sounds a lot like uh, what they did with Sony Morpheus. Very similar. Um, I think it's a little uh, narrower probably than Morpheus is. The arms themselves, the ones that are attached to the ring, are very flexible. Okay. Uh, they explicitly said, hey, be careful because you can break them if you're, if you're not being careful. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. There's a USB port on the back of one of the arms. Uh, the band, when you adjust it in and out, tends to grab your hair. Where do you think the battery was? I'm sure it's in the. I'm sure there's battery through the whole thing, but okay. definitely the arms. So the outside, the the outer ring, maybe yeah. that's where the battery and I'm, hardware I'm is. I'm sure that the uh, there's a lot of hard. There's a lot of room for hardware above the lenses. Okay. Um, above the glasses, above the goggles, a lot of room for hardware uh, in here, and it's self-contained. So this was totally wireless. Yep. Um, it connects to be a Wi-Fi. They, I think they have Bluetooth as well. They weren't really specific about a lot of that stuff. We asked a lot of questions, and a lot of the answers were, I don't know if I can talk about that. Um, Microsoft does have a blog post right now on their website with some, it's really some cross-section uh, schematics if you want to get a sense of where those sensors are. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. They it's, don't tell you exactly how they work, but they, they have released a little more information. Yeah. Um, so my guide had been on the Connect team previously, and her job on that team was to build top of stack software, so things like instructional code for other developers so they can learn how to build software for it. Um, you say it, it's comfortable to wear? It, I was really surprised at how comfortable it was. Getting it on took a little bit of wiggling every time, but there was no, unlike like the early Oculus, there was no weight on the bridge of my nose. Mm. In fact, it's all in the head. And it worked with glasses on. Mm -hmm. So with glasses on, they said the best thing to do is just pop the pop the nose pads off entirely okay. and let it just kind of ride on the top of your glasses frames. Now, does the do the optics fold down, or you're just fitting them you, the whole unit over your head? The way I ended up doing most of the time was to tilt the ring back until it was in more or less the right place, okay. and then lower the glasses, and then kind of get the ring comfortable, and then adjust the glasses until and they were right. Squeezing your glasses between your eyes and those it wasn't lenses. Um, like unlike the early Oculus stuff, you know, if you used a DK1 with a pair of glasses under them, you probably scratched up your glasses. Mm -hmm. um, there was no contact between my glasses and the lenses. Okay, so there was a little So there was enough of a gap. It was, it was, again, similar to Morpheus. It didn't have the shroud. No, no, that makes sense when it's augmented reality. It, there needs to be some distance between the eyeballs and yeah. the lenses for it to look like something's floating. Exactly. Um, this, the, the outside goggles, the, that lens was a little bit smoked. So and why, I, why is the smoking there? I presume that's so that it'll work in brighter situations than otherwise. Mm. My, you know, if this is, if you've used a set of Google Glass glasses, you know that it works best in like mid medium lighting. If you're in the really bright sun, it's not going to work too great. Um, if you're in dark, it works terrific. But the smoking is just going to, the smoke glass is just going to bring down the outside brightness just enough that it, that it cuts it down. It may even just be polarized. Mm -hmm. We were in a kind of a medium well lit conference room mm -hmm. in a cool hotel. So, you know, there was like splash lighting and flood lighting. That didn't seem to affect it. Mm. Um, but yeah, so the smoking is to make the, I, I'm sure to make the display more and then visible. And when bright, you see light. through that, is the world a little darker around uh, you? Not, it wasn't super noticeable. Okay. It wasn't. It wasn't like you went from being in a light room to a dark room. It wasn't it was, sunglasses. It was. It was um, the closest anal analogy I can come up with was that it was like um, uh, auto darkening sunglasses. You know how they're never all the way clear. Sure. Right. It was kind of like that. Uh, it, auto darkening sunglasses in their non frosting. In, in the inside, yes. Okay. Um, so okay, there's three types of input with Hololens. Okay. This was the this was the stuff that was never exactly clear before. Mm -hmm. um, there's voice input, which we've heard, yeah. voice commands. Those seemingly are infinite. So the developers can register commands. You, I made my app respond to Hello Toledo and I like pie. Um, Do you so hold a button to activate? No, it's all ambient. They were really adamant about oh. that. You don't have to do an address command, mm. uh, like Alexa or Hey Siri or OK Google. Wow. You just talk to it and it picks it up. It did get, if you dropped your command in the middle of a larger sentence, it wouldn't detect that. It has to be at the beginning of a sentence. Hmm. Um, but it is, and, and 
the software, Windows voice recognition software, just kind of handles the phonetic stuff. So um, the my guide said that somebody had done German before, yep. and he had to spell out the things that they, there aren't English equivalents. So he had to phonetically spell them out. But his his German words worked as well as English words. Did too. it feel like it was something being processed? In the headset, or it was over Wi-Fi. I would be shocked if it wasn't in the headset. Okay, it so was it very was fast, fast enough to be yeah. in the headset. I mean, the the response time was, "Hello Toledo, boom," not no. "Hello Toledo, tick tick tick, boom." We haven't talked, about, uh, and we'll get to display in a second. But was there any feedback when you were talking in terms of like it knows at that point it's tracking? Is there? A it didn't give feedback on that stuff. Okay. Like we were in basically a developer. Demo, mm -hmm. so I would assume that in consumer versions, you'd get a little indicator that says, mm -hmm. "Hey, I'm thinking." Or um, I know that you. I assume you're giving a command. A voice yes, command. exactly. Like, like the ear, like an ear icon or something like that. Okay. Um, the other two types of input are gesture input. Gestures okay. are super simple. These seem to be hard coded, so these seem to be mm -hmm. built into the system. And one is making an L with your hand. Either one works. That means ready. And when you want to select something, you tap. So you just tap the two fingers together. Huh. So that's all the gesture command that they had in the demos that we saw. I don't know if that changed with the thirty and the, with the other demo mm -hmm. loop, mm -hmm. um, but it, it seemed like developers couldn't register new commands, which makes sense because I don't know how you would program other gestures. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing is gaze. So um, previously it wasn't clear whether there was eye tracking inside this. There's not. Mm -hmm. It's all based on the movement of your head which makes sense given the FOV of the display. So um, you move your head, there's a circular cursor, at least in our demo, and as you as the cursor's uh, A, it tries to lay flat on whatever surface it detects. So if you're aiming at the floor, it'll be horizontal. If you're aiming at a wall, it'll be vertical. If you're aiming at somebody's shoulder, it'll be kind of diagonally. Um, and the further away you get, the smaller it gets. The closer it is, the bigger it gets. Wow. So there's so some type of depth. distance depth yeah. detection. And so you're moving your cursor around with your head like this, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like laying flat and moving along? Yes. OK. Um, and it, animating along surfaces? Animating along very, relatively smoothly, yeah. OK. Um, it, I took a moment while we were doing one of these sessions, one of, one of the breakouts where we were using the headset, and it looked like a room full of absolute crazy people. Because everyone's kind of going. Yep. I mean, I mean, that could be really fun. And it I was assume fun. this is where, when you see that tracking dot move around, like following like a cat in a laser, basically, uh, that's where you deploy your allocations and deploy your, your, your things. So yeah, or that's if you want to select something, you move the cursor on it and you right. use either the voice command or the, the gesture. The gesture. Yeah. That's a weird gesture. I don't know if um, I like that. It, it actually, so it's worth mentioning on the gesture, I was, I was concerned that the range on the gestures was going to be awkward, that you'd always have to have it up in front of your hand. Mm -hmm. You don't. Like I could have, it, have my hands down right at belt level, and like right in it. front of me. So that's comfortable. Up here. Up here, down here, kind of wherever. The only time I had problems getting the hand to register is if I was looking up at the ceiling. You did have to actually lift your hand up into, you know, into that kind of general 270 degree plane vertically on either side. I mean, Microsoft has done a lot of research in human computer interaction and gestures. You know, my daughter, this is not good. You don't want yeah. this. You don't want to have your hands up. It's tiring. Uh, but I don't know if, and then they have to have it some compli you know, just like. Okay, Google. The syntax, mm -hmm. the the physical syntax, needs to be complicated enough that they can recognize it. But not not so easy that you do it by accident. Yeah, that's it's still it's a little weird. It, I don't know. It, the thing that was good about this is it like the doing the, the they call it an air tap. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you could do it the first try. Everyone yeah. in the room could do it the first try, which I think is I think they're trying to make this as easy a process for people as possible. All right, so you put um, it on. Put it on. And uh, let's talk about what it actually feels like. So you put it on, and the first thing you notice is that the FOV is very small. Mm. Um, if you think of an Oculus or the HTC Vive, Vive as like a pair of uh, dive goggles where, you, mm -hmm. where you're where you looking through something like this and you see basically a circular FOV that's relatively wide, relatively high. This is like holding your hands out about a foot and a half from your face and making a rectangle. Now, uh, is that a difference between the FOV of the world you see, or is that also... You see the whole world. Okay, so you see the whole world around you. You're, you're 180, 200 degrees. Your view is mostly... Un I mean, I'm wearing glasses, so I don't have peripheral right. vision, but I assume that most, most of what you see is like you see most of the world. The world is not unobstructed. There's a little bit obstructed for the goggles on the top, right. a little bit from the arms on the mm -hmm. side, and then like normal glasses so stuff. That's, in terms of your your personal FOV, it's still there, but in terms of what's yes. being brought into the virtual world from the the headset, 
that's going to be a small box. It's a pretty small box. Um, before we, so the demo, the demo that we went through progressed through different stages, starting with just a scene that you couldn't really do anything to, adding basic interaction, and then adding the ability to manipulate it and move it and add, use a cursor. Before you could add the cursor, it felt very limiting. I wanted to look around with my eyes, mm -hmm. not turn my head. As soon as the cursor came into play, your the the. Your, all your movements became head movements and not eye movements. And then you completely lost, like within 15 minutes of putting well, it on the first time, is in the center, my focus was on the center and all I was looking at was the was the cursor. Okay. Um, it's like what John Carmack said with the fovea, like optimizing that that center, the, the good part of your of your retina. You kind of do that automatically when, you, when you're tracking the cursor. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, like I said, it, it was very analogous to those old Sony headsets where you're looking at a 80 inch screen from 10 feet away and it ends up looking about like that. So if something's it's, floating it's, right there, if yeah. you move your head I mean, past it, it will just cut off. Yeah, that's exactly right. Cut off at the, at um, the edge. But the edges of the screen, um, they, they, they weren't blend super into apparent. The, they blend into the world? You, 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 well, so when you, when you slice through an object, they were immediately obvious because there was a hard edge where there shouldn't mm -hmm. be one. When you were, when, and something that I noticed myself doing almost immediately was avoiding moving my heads in a way that sliced through objects, right? My head in ways that sliced through objects. So you just kind of naturally kept everything in the, in the field of view that you wanted. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's like the first thing you noticed. The resolution on the screen was pretty astounding. So that's a big question we have. Um, we, Obviously, it's not an LCD or an OLED screen for in front of your face. We don't know how they're displaying it right now. It sounds like it's something similar to what Sony and Google have in their augmented reality displays. Google Glass, even though it was a tiny display in the corner, the fidelity was such that you could read text. Yes. No problem. Does it feel similar to Google Glass? So, yeah, when you, when you put this on, the closest experience I have is actually that Avagon display the Avagon head-mounted display that uses a DLP projection system to blast off directly in your eyes. The resolution was really, really good. Okay. Um, you were able to read text. One of, the, one of the objects in the world was a crumpled up paper ball. It looked like newspaper. You could read the newspaper two layers down. Wow. Um, the text was clear even from, say, five feet from the virtual object. So let's, let's put this in pers perspective. Yeah. If, you know, this piece of paper I couldn't I have, read that from here. And so how close would the paper have to be from your virtual eyes? I, I was able to read it from you know, the distance that I would normally read a piece of paper. But you'd be able to recognize that there's text there. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so if a piece of paper is in front of you, you know, virtual desktop in front of you. If I was holding it out here, I was able to read right. it. If I was holding it right here, I was able to read it. Three feet away, you could read text. Yeah, three, okay. three, and also up close, which is important. Right. Um, so the, 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 there were no jaggies, mm. the pixels, seemed really large. I couldn't really see definition of pixels. There was no screen door at all. So the pixels were large, but there's no jaggy. So it really seems like the, the fill rate. I think the, the fill percentage is very high is probably okay. the right way to say that. So whereas with an LCD, you have a relatively small amount of the area of the, screen, of the display making the light. Mm -hmm. With this, a lot, there, were, there was really good fill, um, very low jaggies. Mm. Um, I mean, we were rendering really simple stuff, so they could have been running mad anti-aliasing on it. But right. still, like it was, it, it was well done. I was, I was surprised, and also the screen was very bright. So I expected it to be mostly translucent in mm -hmm. the way that the Google Glass screen is, yeah. and even like the Avagant without the head, without the shroud is going to be. Mm -hmm. With this, you put your hand up, and there's an object there. You can't see through to your hand. You maybe wow. see the barest outline of your hand, but it's it's essentially blocked, over overwritten by the display. Um, and this was, again, this was in a, I would call it a medium, the low side of medium brightness, like normal brightness room. Um, I can't imagine that it's going to work well outside. I don't think that they're intending for it to work outside. Right. Um, but yeah, so. I mean, we've, we've used Google Glass, and Google Glass mostly is translucent text, and we can see kind of the, the gray box where text a, lives. We see a black background, usually. Yes, yeah. and for uh, Google Glass, one of the ways you can view a fully realized image is, for example, video recording mm -hmm. with Google Glass. And even when you're recording video and you're putting that overlaying that on top of the real world, you can kind of see a little bit peek through. Yeah, so this, this um, now there was, it was weird though, because there's no occlusion detection, or at least in the thing that we did, there was no occlusion detection. So if you had your hand on the other side of the virtual object, everything makes sense, your brain isn't weirded out. When you move your hand between where your brain thinks the virtual object is and your hand is. Because it's mapping the surface of the table. Right, then you don't see, 
your yeah. hand, and that's weird. It doesn't like stop projecting where your hand is, okay. which I wouldn't expect it to do. Like, that's a third or fourth generation feature. It means they have to do more mapping, better yeah. spatial mapping, more real-time spatial mapping, and with uh, with lower latency. It also seemed like the spatial mapping stuff broke down the when you got really close to the display, which is not surprising if they're using stereo cameras and they're mounted on your temples up here. So that's the two you're questions. Not see that. Registration with the world in yeah. terms of mapping and latency. So registration with the world uh, was better than I expected. One of the at one of the points that we used it, we turned on uh, a wireframe mode, so you could see what the what the sensor was seeing, what the depth camera was okay. seeing. Um, and it, it, there was a little bit of latency as it was kind of building a model for that, especially right at the beginning. But then as you walked around the room, it would just the, the wireframe would just kind of roll in. So it there was a wireframe of the walls of the room. Of the walls, of the, the floor, floor, of the ceiling, of the other people, of the couches, of wow. the coffee tables. That's um, cool. I, want to, I just want to use that <laughs> as the experience. It was, it was a really low res wireframe. It was super rough. So like a person would be, I'm going to say like, about the same number of triangles as, say, a Quake 1 model, maybe 200 to 400. Well, it's good enough to put a surface on. It was, Yeah, it was good enough to know where the flat surfaces mm -hmm. are, which is really all you're going to use this for mm -hmm. right now. So was the registration as good as what they demoed on stage in their build keynote? I would say, remember at the beginning of the build keynote where the little robot kind of jumps into place? Mm -hmm. That happened a fair amount. Okay. Um, it wasn't... It wasn't as distracting as problems in VR are to people. Mm -hmm. Like it, you, your brain just kind of like, oh, something's weird there. I'm gonna ignore that for a second, and then it was okay. Yep. Um, but it was, it was definitely noticeable, especially when you would bring a scene into the picture for the first time. It would kind of, it would kind of go for a second, and then just, just skate an inch or two into place. So the other question then is latency. So latency was rough. Okay. Um, like the latency that we were seeing with this would would have been completely unacceptable for VR. It kind of didn't matter for AR. Your brain, because you have the outside perspective of the real world, to ground you, and and yeah, and that's that's what your brain is like. Okay, I know that this is the world. I'm not worried about the the percentage of stuff that is not being updated fast enough was low enough that it wasn't. It wasn't as disconcerting as it would have been in VR. Uh, like, it, at no point did I feel uncomfortable. Right. I mean, comfort's one thing in terms of accuracy. Did it take you out of the the believability that something was um, interacting with that world I because would, it wasn't perfectly moving in sync with it? I think the analog. So let me. I'll describe what, what happened, and then I'll talk about how it made me feel. Um, when your when your head wasn't moving, mm -hmm. everything was rock solid. Or when your head was moving very little. Mm. So, like if you were say sitting in a chair or leaning in and looking at something, it was fine. Mm. If you were walking towards something, there was a, a stair step, you know, a chunk, 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 chunk right. that was happening. I mean, I, I didn't have a watch or stopwatch, obviously, but it seemed like less than I'd say 20 or 40 times a second it was definitely not 90 or 100 Hertz maybe rotational um, scaling is easier for them than I, than depth scaling. so definitely lateral movement was harder than turning your head mm. um, the uh, the overall effect at first I thought I might have a bad headset or maybe something was moving inside my glasses and it was causing problems they replaced the headset so and, and it was exactly the same it wasn't disconcerting at all hmm. um, because if you think about it, the times that you were looking, it's not like I was running through a video game and I needed to have pixel perfect precision on the, on the game. It's that I was walking around the edge of something to see the other side. And so it was bad maybe out of the peripheral vision or as I was walking. But rea in reality, because the FOV is so small while I was walking, unless I turned, the thing that's virtual wasn't going to be in my in, in my line of sight anyway. So it wasn't until I got back to the other place. You know, it's it's if it made you uncomfortable, it would be avoidable. It didn't make me uncomfortable at all, and it didn't even really pull me out of the thing. It was just like, oh, that's a little weird. It it, it seemed it, it honestly it seemed like a glitch in the matrix, hmm. right? It's something you notice. Your brain files away as odd, and then you just move on and keep going about your business. I mean, the the pros and cons of AR versus VR kind of work against each other, where it. You, know, you the AR, you're more susceptible to things looking weird, but mm -hmm. not being uncomfortable. Um, so I heard, a, I've read a lot about uh, the audio in this demo being really good. Yeah, so the audio was really interesting. They did binaural. Uh, I, I, they said they did binaural in the in the um, in the mm -hmm. article on TechNet. Um, they didn't actually say that in this demo whether this was a binaural demo, but it seemed like it. Uh, basically, you. When we turned audio on, we affixed it to a position in the world, meaning the center of the model that we had built. And from that point, you could walk around 
and the the little speakers in the, the so the little speakers dangle in those red tabs, mm. and they basically aim right at your ear. So so they're speakers, not earphones. They're speakers, not earphones, okay. which is important with AR because you need to be able to interact with the people around you. Yes. So so at first it was very distracting. And I was unable to hold a conversation with someone. By the second time I put them on, you know, in five minute chunks, by the start of the second five minute chunk, I was able to have a conversation with our helper. And she was able to kind of direct me to do some stuff. Uh, and you were able to have a conversation with somebody else that was in the, the world without distracting you. And the, the 3D audio stuff was really, really nicely done. I mean, this is something that John Carmack talked about wanting for VR. <laughs> uh, as a, you know, you need guaranteed audio, so not everyone's going to. Even though people can use their own headphones, not everyone's going to be able to or want to. And so you need an audio system built in. And headphone system isn't always the most comfortable. So having little speakers that are perfectly adjusted to the headset and calibrated for the headset can be the best way, even though it's going to leak out. But also for AR, it lets you listen into the world. And these speakers are, are were a little bit strange. They were horizontal line. There was a they dangled down. There was a horizontal line, and it seems like the speaker the sound was coming from all sides of that speaker. Um, so the upshot is you got a sound field, whether it was music or like a crumpling paper sound effect. You could tell more or less exactly where it was. So, you know, it's difficult for me to do any real test because you have to be looking at the paper to make the crumpling sound. Mm. But like you could stick your head into the middle of the model, and it sounded like the sound was coming from all around you. No, did if you it, turn uh, one way or the other, you would hear right ear, left ear, above or below. Is that something where the combination of looking at something you know, off on the side and hearing it from the side, those things work together to make it more believable? Uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely sells the whole effect. Okay. So, um, you know, if you, if you were around in the late 90s and did any of the HRTF demos, mm -hmm. You know, once you have that kind of positional sound and you know, oh, there's something coming from up into my right, it, it's it's a really great effect and is very it helps sell the whole thing. And like with VR, this is going to cue you to tell you where to look at any particular time in AR because it was kind of easy to lose your your stuff. Did you have to do anything with the Windows 10? No Windows 10 interface ah, stuff at all. I know okay. I was bummed about that. Um, I don't think that the other demos had that stuff either. So I so think they were just basically app demos. Developer-centric demo to get developers understanding what the hardware can do and how they can start making this apps was work. This was very much the traditional programmer demo of, look, it's how easy it is to implement this in your code. You just need to call this function and replace your camera with this. And you call this function and replace your other thing with this. And this is your physics package. And it's all one line of code in the most, I mean, of all the hallmarks of Microsoft developer conferences that look we can do all of this with one line of code is the is the most Microsoftian. We obviously have a lot more questions about this. Uh, is there anything else you want to share from your experience? Um, um, so the end of the demo basically they showed uh, a, we had built this little scene with some paper airplanes and, and um, the paper balls and stuff like that. At the end of it, you clicked the scene, you added one more function, and when the paper ball hit the floor on that one, it basically opened up a portal into another world. Mm -hmm. um, and they showed a bunch of really neat lighting tricks with that, that, that I presume are stuff, stuff they're gonna show people how to use, that let you add the appearance of depth to say a hole in the floor, so or a hole in the wall. So this was just the floor, Got it. Um, but it looked like the, oh, the, the floor is suddenly two inches thick, and you can see edges there. You can get right up, right up next to it. Like I was literally laying on the floor looking at it, um, and and the way that they were doing the shading made it look like there was depth when there was no floor. You couldn't see the floor through the through the hologram, hmm. um, and then you could also do stuff because it was three D and you could place the scene. I could do something like place the scene on the ceiling, tap the button, have the floor, and all of a sudden I was in the nether world underneath what was previously underneath the floor and kind of walk around and explore. And that was super, super appealing. Mm. So being in the virtual world, you still could see the world around you in your peripheral vision, but in that viewport, in that in that small FOV in the middle, you, you were looking around, you were seeing like rolling green hills and, and origami cranes flying around and poofy polygonal, polygonal it, it, clouds. It sounds like one of those really nicely done anamorphic chalk drawings on the ground, except refreshed at however many hertz they're refreshing it, yeah. and, and just in real time. And and for what it's worth, when I was walking around the nether world underneath the underneath the floor or the ceiling, whatever it was, the um, the refresh rate and judder stuff was much less. It was it wasn't just I didn't even notice it. Hmm. Yeah, you, know, you were so lost in hey, this is a, this is a completely new experience for my brain. Um, that, 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 getting closer to virtual reality, that's filling up. 
it, almost it, all of the space. It is, lens. but the big difference is it's still only probably 20% yeah. of your field of vision. So even if it was a bad, what would have been a terrible VR experience was an okay AR experience because you had enough context from that other 80% of the FOV to make you not feel nauseous or, or uncomfortable. Um, and just to be clear, never felt nauseous, never felt uncomfortable. Um, I'm, I'm super interested to see what real applications look like. The big takeaway I had from this is that I don't think they really know what people are going to use this for. Like it seems like they want to give it to, give, get some to developers and mm -hmm. see what what comes out. Yeah, hopefully um, uh, they're also giving developers tools to track your hands and objects and so they can overlay as opposed to you know so fingertips for example skeletal modeling that kind of stuff. I think I think they're going to start real simple with just the one gesture from yeah. what from what they said to yesterday. Cool. So that's Hololens. Um, that's a, a first. Impressions from HoloLens. Uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot more of it before the end of the year. Windows 10 launch window. There are a bunch of other people who've tried it. Read their stuff as well. Uh, and if you have questions, post them in the comments below. And yeah, we'll, like I said, we're going to try to get Patrick on for next week's podcast, and we'll answer as many of them as we can. Then uh, see you next time. Thanks for watching. See you. Bye. Bye. Have a good weekend.